Hello and welcome to today's um, webinar. This is an extra one, it's not based on a report, it's an informative webinar based on something that's relevant right now. Um, it's going to be a short webinar giving you up to date with the UN, that's United Nations, Minamata Convention on Mercury and what that means for coal. The IEA Clean Coal Centre have been at the heart of the negotiations since its inception in 2008, so we really do have a feel for what this means for the coal sector. I'm Dr. Leslie Sloss and I've been leading the coal partnership during this time. Everything you need to know about the UN Convention is available on this website, which is named correctly so that it's easy to find with Google. Everything you need to know is on there. You can click through the site and find all of the documents, all of the terms of the negotiation, and the text of the convention itself. Now, the website's updated daily with a number of signatory countries, so it's quite exciting to watch as it moves through ratification and into action. As of this morning, we have 83 countries ratified. We needed 50 to get the, the, the whole convention ratified and into action, and that was achieved on the 5th of August. So COP1 was held during October, and we're moving into action. And so now the countries are having to plan as to how they're going to comply with this new convention. This is the text, this is the cover of the text document, which can be downloaded directly from that website in the six official UN languages. It's a one-click download, and it covers everything from the banning of mercury mining, the curtailment of exports, phasing out of mercury use in products such as face, so creams, and dental amalgam, and so on. It also addresses such issues as storage and disposal, and of course, it covers emissions. The text also gives details and requirements for funding and reporting, and so it's quite a lot in there for a small book of under 40 pages. It's a very handy guide to, to what is required. Now, when we concentrate on what's happening and what it means for the coal sector, the text really isn't that wordy. It's a little bit more bureaucracy speak than technical information, as I would view it. And Article 8 refers to the emissions from safe and resources. That only takes up two pages, so it's relatively concise. It obviously includes coal burning as a combustion source, but it includes other stationary sources, such as smelting, waste incineration, cement, and clinker production. Those are listed in an E. Because it's an annex, that means it can be updated, so if they find any new sources of mercury that have been previously overlooked, they can be added within Article D, uh, sorry, Annex D to Article 8. So how we deal with the emissions under Article 8 depends on the definition of the source, which is cited within that article. So a new source is one that isn't running yet, or for which construction hasn't been completed, and won't be until at least one year after ratification by the relevant country. So only applies to new plants, which theoretically still have time to be modified as they move towards completion. New source also applies in some ex to some extent to anything that has gone through a substantial modification. That's anything that's done to that plant that will increase its emissions, such as increasing the size of the boiler, maybe changing the fuel that it's using, removing for some reason a, a pollution control system, anything that would make emissions go up, as this is something that obviously has to be avoided. An existing source is anything that's chugging away now or will be within the next year. It's already under constructions. There's no way of changing the way that it's going to operate bef before it starts, is the way that that is what that means. So the National Action Plan is what you have to do first under the Minamata Convention, and it's for each country to come up with its own national plan how they plan to control, or where possible, reduce mercury. And that's what the, the, the convention says. It says control. It says control here un, under this section. But at the top of the convention, it also says control, or where possible, reduce. It's phrased such that everybody is to do their best to reduce emissions, but accepts that there is a challenge. For example, if you have an emerging economy that's growing, they're going to need to expand their power and industry sector. And so although they may well be putting in newer, cleaner plants, the emission total is still going to go up because of the increase in activity within that sector. And this is largely unavoidable. But the overall effect is to be controlled. So what the convention is saying, even if you can't effectively reduce your emissions from a growing sector, please control the growth in the, those emissions. Within four years of ratifying, so that will be 2021 for any countries who have signed already, 
each country must have a flat plan. This means that countries are currently working on these inventories to ensure that they have a real idea of what sources they have and what challenges they may face. For many, this is based on the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme's toolkit. It has base emission factors for each of the sectors and for different source categories. Now, the Coal Partnership has been working with some of these countries to produce more country and coal-specific emission factors, which will give a more accurate idea of the total emissions from the coal sector specifically. And I'll talk about those projects more a little bit later. But it will only be possible for countries to demonstrate emissions control and reduction if they have actually have a measured starting point, and hence the need for these baseline inv inventories and for them to be produced as soon as possible. So moving on to the requirement, um, breaking them up into the requirements for new coal sources and for existing new coal sources. Within the text, it says that there is a requirement for BAT, best available techniques, best environment practice, where feasible to control and where feasible reduce, as I've explained, as soon as practical, but no later than five years after the date of entry into force. So that will mean 2021 for the countries that are signing up just now. These new plants have to ensure that they are based on BAT-BEP within five years ratification. There is an alternative to work by emission limits, but this is a little bit confusing as the acceptable emission limits are levels which would have been achieved using these BAT-BEP approaches. And therefore, you will actually have to install the BAT-BEP to get to the emission limit. So basically, it's a BAT-BEP requirement, but it may have an emission limit so that the BAT-BEP is working correctly and achieving the reduction that it should be achieving. It does also have a time relevance. Because BAT-BEP is just defined as BAT-BEP and not as a specific technology, it means that it can evolve as more efficient control technologies are developed over time, which they are. People are investing in new commercial systems on a daily basis. And so this trend is guaranteed to ensure that BAT-BEP is a living specification that will remain relevant as technologies advance and that BAT-BEP will continue to achieve more and more reduction as the convention progresses. So that's the requirement for new sources, the BAT-BEP or an ELV that's equivalent to a BAT-BEP. For existing sources, it's a little bit more complicated because this is where it will be more expensive to go back and retrofit. And so there are more caveats on this section. So for these existing units, the compliance deadline is 10 years away, so 2027 for currently ratified countries. These existing sources have a, a number of options for compliance. They can go via a quantified goal that can be applied to an individual source or a whole sector. So an, a, an imaginary country such as Colbania could set a target for mercury reduction for their whole coal sector of, say, 30% within five years. Now, if Colbania is still building new plants, if it's an emerging economy, it could set a target of perhaps limiting the growth of mercury emissions to maybe 10% on a baseline year, despite significant growth in this power sector. Whatever the country decides is its target must be agreed at the COP and therefore must also be a little bit challenging. It can't just be a, we promise to do the best we can. It has to have a defined target and goal. The next option for existing sources is the ELV, the emission limit value. Now, this is what's happening in North America and the e, um, and USA with the MATS emission limits and the EU with the BREF document that we've spoken about in other webinars, where they've set an actual emission limit such as somewhere between 3 and 7 micrograms per cubic meter. And so these countries are already sort of largely in compliance with this requirement because their own regional and legisl national legislation will be satisfactory under the Minamata Convention as well. And so for at least for the coal sector, these countries are already in compliance and Minamata will have a limited effect. The third option is the BAT-BEP, same as from the new sources. And this is using the best approaches as defined to reduce mercury. And I'm going to have to explain that, so I'll, I'll go through it that in a few slides after this. The fourth option is a multi-pollutant control strategy. Now, anyone that knows mercury and has read our reports knows that you can't reduce emissions of particulate SOX and NOx without also reducing mercury and vice versa. So any approach which reduces several of all of these uh, emissions makes absolute sense. It especially makes sense for emerging economies. 
Some countries do not yet have legislation for socks and knocks, and to expect them to start off with a limit for mercury just doesn't make sense. So this approach would encourage countries to consider mercury inside particle socks and knocks as these pollution control systems are applied, working and fitting these systems so that they're controlling all emissions at once. The last option on this list is what's listed as alternative measures, and it really leaves the door open for anything. Fuel switching, renewables, anything you can think of that hasn't been imagined yet, which can reduce emissions. So in terms of being prescriptive, this really isn't. This pretty much gives you suggestions, but leaves you entirely to your own devices to come up with what you're actually going to do in practice. And this makes a lot of sense for countries who have a challenge ahead and who are perhaps scared of stepping up to signing to something that they don't understand. By signing up to Minimata, they are committing to make a change, but they will have time to determine which change is possible and appropriate for their particular source. So moving into the technology side of things, this is the BATBEP guidance. It's available as a one-click download, again, from that website in the six UN languages, and it's broken up into different sections. The introduction section describes what the document does and doesn't do, along with the relevant caveats about where it would apply, which calls are more challenging than others. It, uh, the technique section summarizes the different approaches to reduce emissions, fuel blending, switching, cleaning, and so on. Monitoring obviously looks at the emissions measurement side of things. The coal chapter concentrates specifically on the BAT methods that are relevant to coal plants, obviously, and there are further chapters and other sources, such as the non-ferrous metals industry and so on. So it's all there broken up into nice um, eaten sections, as you may say. So this is a, a cut-and-paste picture of the contents page for the BAT-BEP chapter, which applies to any sectors which use coal. Now, it covers everything from coal washing, coal benefit effects, it covers the coal benefits, um, not sorbitants, sorbitants and additives, it includes ballpark figures for control costs too. So it's basically like a sort of shortened version of one of the IEA clean coal reports and it includes a similar amount and type of information. But look at that context list. It is extensive, but look at the page numbers. The information there is very general. They're not a lot of writing in those few papers there. It's a document that explains the definition of each of these approaches and some basic information on how they work, but it is not a manual for putting these control systems into practice. That isn't to say it doesn't contain a wealth of information, because it absolutely does and it has some great references and it's been extremely well written, but it is not a prescriptive manual for how to reduce mercury emissions from the coal sector. Moving on to the, the, the BAT-BEP side of things, this is the content section for that, uh, specifically for the coal combustion sector. Again, comprehensively covers everything from control um, through to air pollution control systems, environmental management, so you're looking at efficiency, you're looking at um, sound waste management and closing up of the, the whole bubble around the plant. But it does so more in the form of informative definitions again, rather than trying to be a prescriptive control manual. Just a cut and paste of the monitoring guidance page. Um, covers everything acceptable from continuous emissions monitoring through the sorbent trap, the wet chemistry methods, the mass balances, predictive systems, emission factors, and engineering estimates. And it kind of does so in order of preference. Continuous, sorry, continuous emission monitors are obviously going to give you very accurate real-time information on a plant-specific basis. Sorbent trap gives you a grab sample, which is very accurate and provides speciation. Impingers does the same, but is more hard to do. Mass balance predicts of emission factors and engineering. These are calculations that are not specifically normally based on the plant in question, and so although they do give you a best guess, they are just that, a best guess. Now, the BAT-BEP guidance also includes some actual technical data, just to make sure that it's not just definitions. I haven't uh, misrepresented it. It's not detailed, but it's not to say it isn't useful. It includes tables like this. Um, this table shows the results for different coals in different plants worldwide and shows the range of emission levels reported for each. Now, these data have been see by the Zero Mercury Working Group and examples of modern plants fitted with state-of-the-art control systems. And so the emission levels are very low and reflect the lower end of the range of emission levels one would expect to see from a coal fire power plant. 
However, they do emphasize that relatively low emission values can be achieved and are being achieved in practice. This is an example of what can be achieved with mercury-specific options. The previous slide was, was co-benefit effects. This is mercury-specific, so you're talking about filters, carbon injection, and so on. And again, these data are for plants in the EU and North America, for which most data are available. Many emerging economies are working with more challenges in older and less efficient plants. And so it's quite likely that mercury reducing um, programs in these areas will be more challenging and potentially more expensive. But the BATBEP document opens with a caveat emphasizing that mercury emissions are control, uh, uncontrolled, sorry, are coal and plant specific. They acknowledge that. However, despite that, during COP1, several countries, including India and Thailand, wanted it officially recorded that the application of the BATBEP document is challenging to high ash coals and would need to be evaluated and updated and further project work is needed in this area is required, which is absolutely acceptable and is what we plan to do within the coal partnership. We want to prove to them that the BATDEP document may not include examples from high ash and, and um, indigenously low ash, uh, low quality coals, but the chemistry and the theory behind mercury control will still apply to those coals. The BATDEP guidance document was intended to be a living document, and so the working party is more than happy to receive new data and emissions control for these different calls. And this information will be collated, added to the, the document, and disseminated as necessary. So within the convention, there is an explanation of how to apply this BATBEP in, in, in practice. So how is a country going to comply with the convention? It's a step process. First of all, you must look at your sources. As part of your national inventory, you've got to list all your sources along with the activity data and the estimated emissions. In addition to this, you're going to have to include information such as your coal type, control technologies already in place, plant efficiency and age, and basically all the information required to get a handle on what the source is and what it's doing. Now, if a plant is going to close in the near future, then perhaps it can be ignored to some extent or, or grandfathered, but if any plants plan to upgrade soon alternatively, then now is the time to retrofit. So this is the time for sensible thinking based on plant data. This is where you define your new sources versus your existing sources, and also where you can identify a low-hanging fruit in terms of gaining the most significant mercury reduction. Step two, then, will be to compare your list of sources with the BEP guidance and list the options that may work on each plant. So plants which already have sulfur control systems will have a different mercury reduction option from those which do not. Step three is to tick off the options which won't work at each of those plants. If you don't have any space for a full-size wet FDD system, then you may have to consider a modular or a multi-pollutant control system. If you have limited water availability, then you're going to be looking at something that doesn't require water. So you'll be looking maybe more at a sorbent or additive type thing, a dry solution. Step four is then sitting with your plant options next to you and looking at your individual national minimata commitment. Has your country agreed to reduce total emissions by 50%? Then look for the low hanging fruit. You're not doing something across the board then. You're looking for the most cost effective approach just to get to that 50% reduction. If you've set an emission limit, then that's the opposite end of the spectrum. You are going to have to sit on a plant by plant basis, look at the current emissions from those plants and looking at how to get there based on your control technologies available. If you've gone with the BAT BEP requirement, then you're going to have to define what BAT meets, means in your specific situation, taking your coals and plant characteristics into account. You have to look at what you're aiming for and work out how to get there. Step five is listing the options which will work for your plant and then looking at the cost. And this is the crux. This is not just for fitting this technology, but for the upkeep and continued maintenance and operation. Cost is going to be a significant factor for many countries. And this is where the GF and the World Bank funding will determine just how much mercury can be reduced in these countries with economical limitations. Because this is almost the cop-out clause that although it may be possible for some countries to reduce their mercury emissions, can they afford to do so? 
and deciding whether it's possible is fairly expert stuff. This is, requires engineering knowledge, chemical skill, an idea of control costs and running costs. And of course, some, some countries simply don't have that. And it's hoped that countries which see this as too much of a challenge will get in touch with the United Nations Environment Programme with us in the Coal Partnership and will ask us for help. So moving on to compliance for the countries, just to kind of give us a quick overview. Here's the to-do list. What are you aiming for? You have to have your national action plan. Are you going to aim for a total reduction of 50% for the whole country, or are you going to concentrate on an emission limit value for the coal sector? You have to define what you're going to do. You need to look at your sources, evaluate them. You need to work through the BATBET guidance or ask for help with that. And then you need to carefully decide how to move forward on a case-by-case -case basis, and you have to cost that up and then start your work. Now, the UN Coal Partnership, as I said, is here to help. This is the web page. It's currently being updated, so it can be slow to load, so give it time. But it's there as a tool for you. The, Le the Coal Partnership has been led by the Clean Coal Set since its inception in 2008. We've been there for all rounds of negotiation. We've helped write the BATBEP and other support documents. We've run projects, but we are voluntarily and largely unpaid. And we've been relying on our partners to help with moving this convention into action and to helping us get further project work. This is an example of some projects we've done in the past. We've done some inventory work in India, Russia, China, and South Africa, and we're currently doing new inventory work in Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. We've produced the little iPod calculation tool that we call it, the inter, uh, um, Interactive Process Optimization Guidance Tool, which is a kind of working tool for guessing how to choose the best available technology for your plant. If you're interested in that, do email me. We have a separate webinar on that. What we also plan to do, excuse me, is create a library section on the new website, which will include obviously the coal partnership documents, but hopefully documents provided by our partners, uh, which can help ratifying countries and provide guidance. So a summary of our, our work, we've done the inventory projects. Um, we are hands-on, that is me in the picture there. We do get our hands dirty and we do that. Now these projects we've done so far were funded by the European Union and Environment Canada, and that funding is pretty much complete now. So as we move forward, we are looking out for um, any new project, any new funding. Up to now, these projects have been defined by the funding agent. We're hoping to be a little bit more proactive and that we can suggest what kind of projects would have the most effect in emerging economies, and we're happy to to open to ideas for that, so please do get in touch if you're interested in the, the coal partnership work. The potential future work that we've identified so far is the GEF 7 round of funding, which is looking at setting up a program of funding for emissions control. It's very general at this stage, and we're hoping for guidance on what kind of projects they will want. But as soon as we get a better definition, we will step forward and hopefully come up with some ideas of some projects we can put into place. We're happy to help with national implementation plans as each country works through the, the Minamata Convention to decide how best to comply. We're happy to work with demonstration projects. We'd be more than happy to work with India, with Indonesia, with countries with challenging coals to prove that the BAT BEP does apply to them. And as and when this data comes in, we're of course happy to update the BAT BEP, taking this new information into account. So as a living document, it becomes more and more useful as time goes on. Now this is the Coal Partnership. It's, as I say, it's on the UNEP website. Um, click on it and you can become a partner. It costs absolutely nothing. You have to fill in this form that you download and complete, send it back. You send in a letter uh, on your, with your logo and your uh, letter-headed paper saying that you want to be part of the partnership and why. And then you're a partner and you get to use this funky little um, red dot on the right there, the Global Men uh, Mercury Partnership member. You can use that on any of your documents or on your and hopefully that can be an active link that will click between the members on the partnership website through to the members website and back again to the UNIT website and hopefully will become far more interactive. Now moving forward with this, it's the early stages of the COP, the convention is just moving into practice so we're still defining what the coal partnership could and should be doing. So as part of our, the coal, Clean Coal Centre's annual meeting, MEC, um, Multi-Pollutant Emissions from Coal, half a day of that is usually set aside to coal partnership work. So please do come along to the, the MEC meeting. We have 
literally this week decided when it's going to be. It's going to be in Krakow in Poland on the 16th to the 18th of May 2018. So please do um, register for that. The website will not be live for another month or so, but please do register and join us there. And in the meantime, we have our Clean Coal Centre blogs and reports that have a lot of information that was extremely useful to those people trying to get the Minimata Convention into practice. So thank you very much for listening. Um, that was a, a quick run through of everything. I only have time um, for one quick question. Fortunately, I have one sitting here. Um, which countries are most likely to actually move in the coal sector as a result of Minamata? Uh, okay, so ex that's a commercial question. Where are the market going to open up as a result of Minamata? Well, countries such as the USA and the EU are already moving and, and Japan because they already have emission limits and are effectively planning to apply BAT-BEP technologies. So Europe obviously has its own market, but that's not necessarily a result of Minamata. What you will be looking more at is small emerging economies with growth in the coal sector. So you're looking at Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. As far as I'm aware, Indonesia ratified two weeks ago. I'm not too sure about Vietnam, Thailand. So, so keep an eye on that ratification page for an idea of who's signing up and where the activity is going to happen. I think China has also ratified, um, and it could be surprised as how, how challenging they make their markets as they're setting some really challenging emission limits for SOX and NOx. So there could be a lot of activity there. I hope that answers that. If anyone has any other questions, I'm always um, ready to reply via email or give me a call. Um, the next webinar will be in November. I don't have the title of that yet, I'm sorry, but if you're on the mailing list, you will get an email notifying you of um, what the topic is and when it will be and the login details. If you're not registered, go on the website, register, and you will be up to date with everything that's happened. Remember, you can log in and see these webinars as catch-up, so do go through the backlist and you will find um, previous webinars such as ones I've given on mercury control technologies and the breath the EU. So thank you very much for listening. Hope you understood. If you didn't, please do email me. Thank you very much.